Welcome back for another deep dive. You guys have really outdone yourselves this time. Well, is that so? You really have. This time you've challenged us with not one, but two books by Shane Caldwell and Steve Boyle Mullman. And, um, mouthful. It is a mouthful, isn't it? W-W-L-O-T-F-G-M. Yeah. Now, before you think I'm losing it, that stands for Web Wilder, Last of the Full Grown Men, The Doll. Right. And trust me, that title will make a lot more sense a little later on in the deep dive. I hope so. So, our mission, to unearth the hidden gems in these stories, and there are many, and to unravel, I think, why this very specific brand of humor hooked you guys so much. Yeah, it's a fascinating pairing, really. Both books, while wildly different on the surface, are connected, like you said, by this thread of absurdity that Caldwell and Boyle weave through their narratives. Yeah. Um, and they explore, I think, the lengths to which people go for, well, love, revenge, or in some cases, a vintage Barbie doll. Yes, exactly, and we will get to that. But let's start at the beginning, shall we? We're introduced to Webb Wilder, this like, almost hard-boiled detective who seems to have stepped straight out of a 1940s film noir, you know? Right, yeah. Um, but what I find interesting is that he's constantly described as this full-grown man, this like relic of a bygone era. What do you make of that, especially in the context of the story? You know, I think that's a really brilliant observation. And it's kind of key to understanding Caldwell and Boyle's humor. Because Webb is this very straight-talking, no-nonsense guy. Yes. And a world that's that's obsessed with the latest fads and schemes, right? He's constantly bumping up against characters who are so caught up in their own desires, delusions, that they've lost sight of what it means to be, I don't know, grounded. Yeah. The humor comes from this clash of personalities. <sighs> like they are constantly highlighting how out of sync he is with with everyone else. He's like the only sane one in the <laughs> room. He's like almost like this audience surrogate. Yes. This voice of reason amidst all this chaos. Speaking of chaos. Oh, here we go. We start with Dusty, the strawberry farmer, who claims that mole men are terrorizing his crops. I mean, come on, mole men. It uh, sounds crazy, right? On the surface, absolutely. But remember those those like seemingly insignificant details we always talk about. Yes. Dusty's claims, though initially they're played for laughs, they become a little more intriguing when he presents Webb with a piece of physical evidence. Okay. This very odd, menacing piece of metal that was unearthed from a freshly dug mound of dirt. It's almost as if Caldwell and Boyle are deliberately toying with our expectations. Okay. Like, maybe, just maybe, there's more to these mole men than meets the eye. Interesting. And just when you think you're in for this, like, monster movie, <laughs> they hit you with a hard left turn. Always. Because Webb's investigation leads him to Thelma's Diner, Wrong. home of the infamous Worm Burger. Oh, yes. Now, I'm not sure what's more unsettling, the idea of Mole Men or a Worm Burger. What do you think? Honestly, I'd take my chances with the Mole Men. The way Caldwell and Boyle describe those burgers. Oh, God. It's practically a sensory experience. Yeah. And not a pleasant one. <laughs> But here's the thing. Okay. Those burgers end up playing a pivotal role in the narrative. It's at Thelma's that Webb encounters Jasper. Okay. This uh, this man with this strange fondness for stevedore clubs. I see where you're going with this. The same kind, you might recall, with the silver claws. Oh, okay. Just like the mysterious piece of metal found at Dusty's farm. It's all connected. Indeed. You know, it's fascinating how those seemingly insignificant details that you mentioned, they suddenly become so crucial in these stories. It's like Caldwell and Boyle are constantly reminding us to pay attention, yes. to look beyond the surface. Yeah. Because there's always more than meets the eye. Precisely. And just as you think the mystery of the Mole Men is about to unravel, we're introduced to a whole new storyline. One involving a beautiful woman named Ruby, some very compromising photos, and a blackmail scheme gone wrong. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Yeah. And to navigate this world of, of high society secrets, Webb has to go undercover. And his disguise... Let's just say it involves a lavender tuxedo and a pencil mustache. Oh, the mental image alone. I'm dying. It's just, it's so far removed from this, like, gruff, no-nonsense persona. Did this, this like, sudden shift in tone work for you, or did it feel jarring? Oh, it absolutely works. Yeah. That's the beauty of Caldwell and Boyle's writing. They, they blend these seemingly desperate elements. Hard-boiled detective, absurd humor, so social commentary. It shouldn't work, but it does. Mm -hmm. And the humor, in this case, comes from the contrast. You know, seeing this tough guy detective forced into this 
utterly ridiculous persona. It's fantastic. You know what? You just reminded me of something. Earlier, we were talking about Webb as this full-grown man. Right. Do you think there's a connection between that persona, that, like, that label, and his ability to kind of, like, adapt to put on these different masks you know it's almost like he's playing a role in this world where everyone else seems to have lost sight of who they really are that's a great point he's able to step into these different roles without losing himself exactly whereas everyone else is sort of trapped by their own pretenses you know Yes, completely. It's true. It's true. He's got this uncanny ability to move through these different worlds without ever losing sight of himself, which is, I think, what makes him such a compelling character. But you know what? All this talk about identity, it kind of brings us to the heart of the second book. The infamous doll. It all comes back to a vintage Barbie doll of all things. Of course. But not just any Barbie. This one is a rare, unreleased model surrounded by all this morbid fascination, right? Because it was intended to hit the shelves around the same time as this major national tragedy. Oh, right. And the irony of that is not lost on Caldwell and Boyle, I can tell you that. Not at all. Yeah. It's like they're using this, this I don't know, culturally iconic toy, this symbol of childhood innocence, to highlight the absurdity of the adult world, wouldn't you say? A hundred percent. The lengths to which people go, the grudges that they hold, all for something that ultimately holds so little significance in the grand scheme of things. It's crazy. It really is. And this is where we're introduced to Daisy and Colin, this seemingly perfect couple who are, you know, about to tie the knot. Mm -hmm. But of course, things are never that simple in Caldwell and Boyle's world, are they? Not at all. Not even remotely. Remember those those like little accidents you mentioned earlier? Yes. The the near misses, the shattered storefront windows. Yes. Well, it turns out they all seem to revolve around this young couple. Okay, so they're not so accidental after all. Well, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> As Webb investigates, he starts to suspect that these aren't just random occurrences. Right. There's this deliberate, almost orchestrated feel to them. And they all seem to be connected to Daisy and Colin's mother's Felicity and Lacey. Of course the mothers. Naturally. Now these two, they despise each other. This is a very common trope, isn't it? It is a classic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But Coldwell and Boyle, they add their own um, unique spin to it. I'd expect nothing less. Right. Their animosity runs deep mm -hmm. and is fueled by this decades-old rivalry. And you'll never guess. What do you think it stems from? Don't tell me. Let me guess. It's that same vintage Barbie doll, isn't it? You got it. It always circles back to the doll. Can you imagine, though, carrying a childhood grudge into adulthood with such ferocity? It's giving Shakespeare, but make it Barbie. Exactly. Except instead of a feud between, you know, noble families, it's over this this child's toy and fueled by these years of simmering resentment. Oh, I know that resentment. Don't we all? And it's this resentment that drives both women to extremes. Okay. You see, Lacey's this big believer in the, the natural, holistic lifestyle. Of course she is. And she sees Colin's family as the embodiment of everything she despises. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. You know it's going to be a disaster, but you can't look away. Precisely. And just when you think it can't get any more outlandish, Caldwell and Boyle introduces to Crazy Kilgore, the, uh, how shall I put this, the over-the-top star of those, um, well, those ridiculous car commercials. Oh, yes. He's loud, obnoxious, prone to wearing a straight jacket. Oh, my God. In other words, the epitome of everything Lacey claims to detest. Yeah. But here's where it gets really interesting. He's also completely smitten with her. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And utterly willing to do whatever she asks, even if it means putting someone's life at risk. Talk about a match made in, well, maybe not heaven. Definitely not. You've got Lacey, the supposed advocate for peace and love, and she's manipulating this, this larger-than-life character into becoming her weapon. Her weapon of choice. Against her own daughter's relationship. I mean, it's, it's kind of brilliant when you think about it. It's like this commentary, right, on how... Our perceptions of ourselves so rarely match the the reality of our actions. Oh, absolutely. It's classic Coldwell and Boyle, really. Yeah. Just when you think you've got them pegged, they, they flip the script. They force you to question everything you thought you knew. Mm -hmm. But but here's the kicker. Lacey's not the only one pulling strings, right? Remember Felicity? Colin's mother. Colin's mother. She might appear more refined, more composed than her, her nemesis, but... Don't let that fool you. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. Felicity's got her own brand of crazy. It's it's classic though, right? This this like over the top, almost comical approach to something as 
as serious as as attempted murder. Right. It's their <laughs> signature move. And, you know, we started the deep dive talking about Caldwell and Boyle's very unique brand of humor. And, and I think it's it's in these moments yeah. where the laughter fades and you're left with that that unsettling feeling. That's where their true brilliance shines through. It's like the stark reminder that sometimes the most unsettling truths, they're cloaked in humor. And that line between between laughter and despair, it can be razor thin. It really can. So the next time you find yourself laughing along to one of their stories, pay attention to the shadows lurking beneath the surface. You might be surprised by what you discover. And that, my friends, is our deep dive into the wonderfully weird world of Shane Caldwell and Steve Boyle. Get your copy of Mole Men and the Doll at Barnes & Noble or Amazon, or ask your local bookseller for Webb Wilder, Last of the Full Grown Men, from Worm Ranchers Publishing. Until next time.